Well, hello. It is certainly a blessing for us to be together again and to have uh, this privilege, this time uh, of study. And as we continue further in our theme of lessons, I want us to focus tonight uh, primarily on one word. Uh, and that word is honesty. Uh, in the words of Billy Joel, honesty, such a lonely word, everyone is so untrue. Honesty is hardly ever heard, but mostly what I need from you. And in some earlier lessons, we talked about what I call the magic word, and we came to understand that the magic word uh, is attitude. Uh, and in that lesson, we talked about how important it was for us to clothe ourselves in humility. We talked about the blessing of being poor in spirit. But as we think about an attitude of mind tonight, I want us to understand that honesty is also required for us to take the responsible actions and make the changes necessary uh, if we are to cope with our challenges and the issues that we face in this life. When we think about honesty, we're talking about being free of deceit, being free of untruthfulness. Some synonyms for honesty could be being sincere, the idea of being truthful, forthright, candid, or open. And as we'll see tonight, two of the highest hurdles that we have to jump when it comes to coping with our problems are humility and honesty. You see, learning to accept the truth about ourselves, learning to accept the truth about our mistakes, our failures, our flaws, our quirks, our fears, learning to accept these things, it is a big pill for many of us to swallow. And you see, that is why humility plays such an important part in us being honest and truthful and candid. And as I talk about honesty tonight, I'm talking about us being honest with ourselves and with God. We look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. And I specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, want verses 9 and 10. But there are some things in the previous verses that are too good for me to pass up. It uh, piggybacks, it uh, reiterates some of the thoughts that we've already covered in previous lessons. Jeremiah 17, beginning in verse number 5, it says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Cursed is the man who trusts in human flesh and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. In other words, Jeremiah says, cursed is the person who trusts in people, who depends on human strength and thus turns away from or stops trusting in the Lord. He says in verse number six, this individual is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come, shall not see when prosperity comes. There's no hope for the future for this person. He shall dwell in the parched and barren places of the wilderness in an, an uninhabited salt land. Verse number seven, contrary wise, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. Blessings are to the individual who has made the Lord their hope and their confidence. When we're talking about trust, it expresses the feeling of safety and security that is felt when one can rely on someone or something else. And so blessed is the individual who looks to God for their source of security and safety. Verse 8, he is like a tree planted by the water that sends out its root by the streams and does not fear when he comes for its leaves remain green. Its leaves are always green and is not anxious in the year of drought 
for it does not cease to bear fruit. It never stops producing fruit. Verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. The human heart is the most deceitful of all. Some versions say, and is desperately sick, desperately wicked. The American Standard Version says, exceedingly corrupt. The heart is deceitful, exceedingly corrupt. Who can know it? Who can understand it? We think about the heart of man. We are talking about deceit of the intellect. In Proverbs 23 and verse number seven, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We think with our hearts. We think about the heart. It is also the seat of our emotions. In Matthew 22 and verse number 37, the Lord commands us to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts. And 1 Peter 1, 22, Peter admonishes the brethren to love one another from a pure heart fervently. And so when we talk about the heart, we're talking about our intellect, we're talking about our emotions, and we're also talking about our volitional capacity, our decision-making capacity. Romans 6 and verse number 17, Paul tells those there that they have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to them. We talk about this heart of ours, our thinking, our emotions, our decision-making, it can be fickle, it can be weak, it can be corrupted. I think it was a song some years ago, I'm dating myself again, where the man said, my, my mind's playing tricks on me. But who can know it? Verse 10 tells us who can know it. Because it says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. God says, I examine the hearts. I examine the minds. I examine those secret motives to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his deeds. And as we think about that message of the heart being deceptive at times, the mind, one of the deceptive elements of the heart is that it tends to deny there is a problem. As we talk about being honest with ourselves, one of the challenges that we often have when we're dealing with difficulties, when we're dealing with life, is the inability to self-assess. Many of us cannot see ourselves as we truly are. We have this tendency to see ourselves have how we want to be, how we want to appear, how we want other folks to see us. At times, we have great difficulty being honest about our fears, our failures, our quirks, all those things I referenced earlier. And instead of admitting them, instead of being honest about them, we, we exhibit certain forms of denial. We deny it. And one form of that denial is what we call simple denial. It's when we pretend that something does not exist when it really does. And one of the ways we do this is when, and many of us probably need to repent, when individuals ask us, are we okay? We may be dealing with a difficult circumstance. We may be struggling. We may be in our feelings because of what someone has said or done to us. It's written all over our face. We are asked, are we okay? And we say, I'm fine when we know we're not. We're not fine. We've got a problem. But we just simply deny it. Another way that we often, uh, the heart tends to be deceptive and deny the situation is by minimizing. Minimizing is when we're willing to acknowledge a problem, but we're unwilling to see its severity. We're unwilling to see just how serious it is. You see, an example of minimizing would be a married couple uh, who are having issues, as they would say. You know, they would admit to there being some estrangement or some tension in the relationship when in fact there's actually a huge problem. There is overt infidelity. 
but they're minimizing it, acting as if the problem is not as severe as it really is. Sometimes this takes place with Christians in our own walk with the Lord. You know, sometimes I talk to folks and I ask them, how are you doing spiritually? You know, we haven't seen you in service for, I can't even remember the last time we saw you. Uh, they tell me that they haven't been reading their Bibles. They tell me they haven't been praying at all. And they say, well, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm doing all right. And maybe they just don't understand, but a Christian who has forsaken the assembly, the Christian who is spending no time with God via prayer or study is not all right. They're in danger. It's severe. Another thing we do, the heart does at times to deny what's actually going on or to avoid being honest is what we talked about last week in terms of blaming. Blaming someone else for causing the problem. Uh, the behavior is not denied as we looked at with Adam and Eve, but its cause is someone else. It's someone else's fault. And so it goes back to the idea that I'm blaming my parents for my current inappropriate behavior. Sometimes husband and wives blame one another. The husband says, well, you know, the reason I'm not loving my wife as Christ loves the church, Ephesians 5, 25, the reason I'm not uh, dwelling with her according to knowledge, 1 Peter 3 and 7, the reason I'm not nourishing and cherishing her and being the spiritual leader that God will have for me to be is because of what she's not doing. And the wife will say vice versa. Sometimes folks blame the elders. They blame the preacher for their apostasy. We blame. We'll excuse. We'll offer excuses, alibis, justifications and other explanations for our situation. We'll dodge. And dodging is something that we've become very uh, adept at doing. We'll change the subject to avoid threatening topics. We become experts in small talk. We don't want any deep conversations. Don't want a conversation to last more than a few seconds. We keep it moving. We're dodging. And keeping people out. And then there's attacking. See the heart. It can deny and we, we attack. We become angry and irritable when a reference is made to the existing condition or flaw or quirk that we have, thus avoiding the issue. And what I'm suggesting to us as we talk about honesty is that before we demand honesty from other people, we must humble ourselves and be honest with God and self. You see, we have to acknowledge that we are naked before God and that he knows our hearts. Look at Hebrews chapter four and verse number 12. It says, for the word of God is living and active, is quick and powerful, sharpening any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It critiques, it judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So verse number 13, and no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. You see, one of the reasons life is so challenging for many of us is because we walk through life trying to pretend that we're something that we're not. We walk through life putting on fronts, giving out this representative, failing to be genuine, failing to be true. And that's one of the things that makes life very, very difficult. But what we have to understand is that there's no need to pretend that no one knows what we're doing, because in reality, God knows all. There's no secret that can be concealed from him. We think about what the Bible says in Proverbs 15 and verse number, thir verse number three, excuse me. For it says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good. 
We talked about this Sunday, and I think it does well for Christians to constantly think about the day of judgment and constantly understand who is my judge. It's not other people. I should not be living to satisfy the whims and the quirks of fickle man. Man is fickle. Think about Jesus. When he came into Jerusalem, they were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, praises be to your name. And just seven days later, what were they crying? What were they screaming? Crucify him. People are not my judge, but God is. And we have to be honest with ourselves about that. We have to be honest with God and realize one day we'll all give an account for the way that we behave. Romans 14, 11, and 12. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 10. Romans 14, 11, 12 in particular says, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess to God. So each one of us must give an account to himself or of himself to God. Look at 1 Timothy 5. Verses 24 through 25. Some men's sins are clearly evident. Some men's sins are obvious. They're easy to see. Proceeding or going before them to judgment. But those are some men follow later. They are not revealed or they don't uh, come to the surface until later. But likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident. They're obvious. And those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Those good deeds done in secret will soon someday come to light. And so you see, as we look to judge and come to our opinions about one another, and yes, I know we are to make and come to righteous judgments, John 7, 24, but you and I don't see all that goes on. Because everything is not evident, but the sins as well as the good works, our sins as well as our good works will follow us to judgment, whether they are evident to us or not, if they are not covered by the blood of Jesus. Paul says in Romans 2 and verse number 16 that God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. You see, when I understand that I may be able to fool the elders, I may be able to fool the preacher, I may be able to fool my parents, my co-workers, my neighbors, I may be able to put up this facade, but I'm not fooling God. When I understand on that day, as I do always, I will stand naked before God. See, when I understand that, I realize I might as well start being honest now. <laughs> I might as well start looking and assessing myself honestly and calling a spade a spade. You know, I think there was a saying that was once said, if I'm going to be free, I have to be me. Not the me you want me to be. Not the me my parents want me to be but I have to be me. And I think the, the accurate view of that, the biblical view of that, of that quote, is if I want to be free, I have to be me. Not the me you want me to be, not the me my parents want me to be, but the me that God wants me to be. Not even the me that I want to be myself, but the person that I am with the talents I have to use that and to be who God wants me to be. And you see, I have to have the mentality that David has here in Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24, where he says, search me, O God, examine me, O God, and know my heart. He says, try and test me and know my anxieties. Know my anxious thoughts, know my concerns, know my worries, and see if there is any wicked way in me, 
He's asking God to search him and to examine him and to point out anything that may offend, to make sure that he's not going the wrong way. He says, lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me along the path of everlasting life. You see, I tell Christians all the time, your, and I like to use the, your consigliere, your closest confidant, your friend above all others should be God. Should be God. You cry to him. You rejoice to him. You tell him your fears. You tell him your cares. You tell him your worries. You take your flaws and your mistakes and your failures. First John chapter one, verses five through nine to him. No point hiding it. He knows. As a matter of fact, he tells us to confess our sins to him. I've got to be honest that I am who I am. You know, my strengths are my strengths. My weaknesses are my weaknesses. My struggles are my struggles. I am a work in progress. I'm not telling you to not grow and mature in Christ, but even as you grow and mature in Christ, you are still you. And we must Make a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves using the word of God as our standard. James 1, 22 through 25. The word of God says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. He said, if we are hearers, only and not doers, we are deceiving ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. We think about the word of God as we make that fearless an unflinching moral inventory of ourselves. The word of God is our mirror. You see, when I look in the mirror physically, I can really see myself as I am. You wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror. There's no makeup, no face has been washed. There are a lot of things out of place. And you can see it clearly. And it gives you an opportunity to fix things. It gives you an opportunity to wipe that away from your eyes, to fix that what's in your nose, to get yourself together. But you have to see yourself as you really are to make those changes. You have to accept that what you're seeing, that's really you. You may not like it. It may need to change, but that is you. And when we look into God's word, it's a mirror. It is telling me who I really am. It's revealing, it's criticizing my thoughts my motives, my actions, my goals, my aims. And I have to be honest at times with all the time with God. And sometimes I have to admit, you know what? Pride is still a problem in my life. I'm not as humble as I should be. I'm not the servant that I should be. Sometimes I have to admit, you know, as I read this, I'm worried about things that God told me not to worry about. I have to admit at times that my faith is in my job and my faith is in my people and not in, in people and not in God as it should be. I have to look into the perfect law of living and say, you know what? I'm playing with God. I'm not giving him my best. And I know it. I got to look in the mirror. And it's it's telling me, it's showing me what's out of place. And I have to be real about that. And be one who looks into that perfect law of liberty and continues in it. Not being a forgetful hero, 
but a doer of the word. One that's doing the best I can to shape up, you know, to make myself presentable for my God. That searching and fearless inventory, it must be conducted while standing unflinchingly in front of the mirror of God's discerning word. And in order to effectively cope, everything we do and think must be measured by God. And we guard against having a deceitful and exceedingly corrupt heart when we meditate on the scriptures, saturating our minds with God's word, coupled with an honest heart. And when we do that, God can then perform the inventory and identify the areas of our life that we need to change. help us to be who he wants us to be. As we think about honesty and bring this lesson to a close, I want us to end with thinking about prayer. There's many things we will say down the road about prayer, but I just want us to look at Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8, and then I want to read a quote from a gentleman who wrote an article about this concept of going in our closet to pray. Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8, it says, Jesus speaking here, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, your Bible may say your closet, and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This is a quote by Robert Milligan, who wrote several articles on the subject of prayer back in the mid-1800s, uh, for a brotherhood publication called the Millennial Harbinger. Uh, and these articles were later published in a small book entitled A Brief Treatise on Prayer. But in discussing Jesus's instruction on going to our closet to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, Robert Milliken wrote, there is no other place, speaking of that quiet secret place and time of prayer, there is no other place beneath the heavens that is so favorable for the legitimate exercise of our moral faculties. Even in the religious assembly, the attention is often arrested and the heart made to wander by some improper display of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life. But from the closet, all such evil influences are excluded. There is no motive to deceive or to make a vain display of ourselves, our dress, and our good works. But there the mind turns in upon itself. There the conscience is awakened. There we see ourselves in the light of heaven. And there, under the deep, solemn conviction that we are on holy ground and that the eye of God is upon us, we are almost compelled to be humble, to repent of our sins, to forgive our enemies, to sympathize with the afflicted, to adore our creator, to love our redeemer, and to exercise all the powers of our souls in harmony with the will of God. I mentioned in a previous lesson about how some folks believe that when we deal with our issues, the problem must be fixed with either more or better education, more or better government, or this concept of therapy. And I've talked to many people. 
I've watched several counseling or therapy sessions. And most people who find relief from therapy, if you ask them, they'll tell you why. And it's because of the catharsis, the cleansing effect of being able to tell someone and to communicate and vent all that they've been holding in to a non-associated party. Someone who they believe won't judge them, someone who can't throw it back in their face and bring it back up. It's the ability to speak freely, to unburden themselves. And I'm telling you, and I'm not saying there's never a place for therapy, but you see therapy for the Christian to a great degree is prayer. It's when we go to that secret, that private space, and we humble ourselves before our God, we remind ourselves of our place, that we are spiritual beggars, nothing without God's grace and mercy. When we humble ourselves and we come clean, God, we come clean with God, with the ugly, the profane, the vile, the regrets of years past, our shames, our fears. The parts of us that we haven't surrendered, but we take it to God. We pour out our hearts. We cast our cares upon him. And we pray for his help. You see, prayer, the language of prayer is the language of dependence. You see, when I pray, I am showing God I need him. It's not a last resort. It's the first resort. I need his power. I need his wisdom. I need his help. I need his forgiveness. When you're alone before the throne of grace, no motive to deceive or to make a vain display of our person, our dress, or our good works, we are practically compelled to recognize that our soul is naked and laid open before God. What else can we do but be honest? Be honest. Are there areas of your life that you're not being honest about with yourself and with God. Now what's hindering you from being honest with the Lord? What's, be, what's hindering you from really just being honest with yourself? I want you to really think, is there anything worth it to allow it to stand in the way from you being what God desires you to be? He already knows. We might as well bring it to him and let him help us with that burden. There's no greater burden than the burden of sin. If you're on the call tonight and you haven't obeyed the gospel, that is a burden that you are carrying, but it's a burden that you can lay down. For Jesus tells all sinners to come unto him for those who are weak and heavy laden. And there's a a rest that he can provide. If you're willing to believe that he is the Christ, the son of God, that he died on Calvary's cross, was buried and rose again on the third day, will you believe the gospel message? Will you repent of your sins, Acts 2.38? Confess that Jesus is Lord, the son of God, as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 to 39. And then, can, then be baptized, excuse me, for the remission of your sins. For us Christians, may we be honest with our Lord. May we trust in him and depend upon him to see us all the way to heaven. 
because it's too early to quit. If we can assist you in any way, please let us know as we sing our song and have our prayer. 